dear sir, the planet Venus is inhabited with beings who look just like ourselves. No doubt you can't see this, not with all the education you may possess, for when one's educated, things become complicated, and that simplicity is non-existible. Dear sir, re the quiet sun. I think the sun acts very strangely. I see it go into a red-hot disk, then change into a new moon, as on Saturday last. It rocked about, went dim and bright, and repeated this until after a few minutes it vanished. Dear sir, on the basis of my theory of cold light radiation from the moon, there should be a period of turbulence, cloud chilling and rain, about the 14th, 15th and 16th of June. Will you please help me to check this? Dear sir, one evening, many years ago in Glasgow, I noticed a series of round balls travelling round three walls of a room. Whatever was causing the images, about three or four inches in diameter, I looked and looked and could discover nothing. Then I noticed that stars in the sky were fading and that as they faded, my balls disappeared. Stars were round. How is it that everyone thinks them pointed? Well, those are some of the many thousands of letters that I've had since I started going on the air and talking about astronomy, which is a good many years ago now. And at least these letters were written by people of independent thought, people who weren't shackled by the strings of convention. I believe, you know, that we're all nowadays too conventional and too regimented. We believe what we're told and we do as we are told. What I want to do in this programme is to examine the ideas and the views of some people who aren't shackled in this way, who are quite prepared to go out on a limb and think for themselves. Now, whether they're right or whether they're wrong is neither here nor there. Uh, I may fundamentally disagree with quite a lot of what we're going to hear. This doesn't matter. This is merely a question of personal opinion. Let's take an example. One of these independent thinkers is the Reverend P. H. Francis, vicar of Stoughton in Sussex, and let it be said at once that he's no amateur. He holds an excellent mathematics degree from Cambridge University, he's taught mathematics for many years, and he still does. One of his theories is that the Earth is not kept warm by heat from the sun. Well, this is a wonderful part of Sussex, particularly in the sunshine, and I can feel the heat of the sun on my neck now, but of course, you don't think the sun's hot? No, the sun isn't hot. It, uh, it's not a hot body, it causes heat. But it, it's not that hot itself. But the sun itself is, is is cold. Well, cold or temperate, like the Earth. Well, how does how does it induce heat in the Earth then? That's what I can't quite get into my mind. The energy there's an energy circle as there's a water cycle, and the sun operates that, and energy changes in a complete circle like that. Sometimes it says heat and so on. Now you feel a, a tree or a bit of wood. A table or anything like that, it's not hot. But it, you can release that energy it's taken in, and the same amount of energy is released when it's burnt or when it decays as it took in from its surroundings. What, what, what puzzles me a bit is that at the moment I'm sitting here, say, in this lovely old vicarage, and I can see the sun, and I can feel what I think is heat on my foreheads coming from the sun. Well, now, uh, suppose you had an electric generating station. It doesn't have to be on fire, yes. but you can have an electric radiator in it, and the uh, generating station, which is completely cold, may be uh, uh, causing heat on your neck. So it doesn't mean that the generating station itself has got to be on fire. The idea that the uh, flaming body is dashing all round about the place is complete nonsense. It's everybody assumes it because everybody else didn't know. Everybody's afraid to be different from everybody else. I'm sure that Mr. Francis is right when he says that we tend to accept what we're told. And I wonder if everything now is so stereotyped and conventional that independent thought is stifled early on. And if so, does school play a part in the stifling? I decided to ask the boys of Homewood House, near Tunbridge Wells, whether they accepted everything that their masters told them, or whether they were ready to strike out along an independent line. Right down here. Right. Oh, come on. <laughs> yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> yes. Well, a good deal of snow around, certainly. I've got some down my neck. Why? Yes, thank, yes. Uh, thanks to you very much. <laughs> ha ha. Well Look, yes. Why does snow fall down? It's uh, water it, freezing. Uh, it's water, water freezing. freezing. And it's too heavy to be held up by the atmosphere, so it falls down. It falls down. Why, <laughs> why does it fall down? This is the point. It's gravity. Well, gravity. gravity, yes. Now, what's gravity? Do you know? Yes, I was. One, one, one at a time. What What do you think gravity is? Well, it is, well, um, um, a, as it says, a push or a pull, which makes things fall towards the this, earth. This is what you've been told, isn't it? Yes. Have you ever tried to prove it? 
What yes. about you? Yes. Well, you trust. Well, you trust. You trust. You trust. Yes. So nothing in the air, it comes down again. I know it does. Yeah. What would you say, for example, of someone who said that the universe ended in a blank wall? Would you think this was reasonable? No. no. What is no. illogical? What is what's on the other what's side? What's the other side? Come on, you haven't had to say yet. What do you think about it all? Well, if if it does end at the wall. What's on the other side of the wall? Yes. There can't be, be just nothing. The There's got to be something. Unless it's just on the other hand, solidness if, forever. What if, what if, on the, the wall? if on the other hand the universe doesn't end, then it's got to go on forever, hasn't yes. it? Well, can yeah. you imagine that? No. No, no. 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 no of course you can't. It's, it's, it's like a never ending and never beginning. Do you ever question this? I mean, do you ever think no. that... No. Do you ever think that everything that we are taught... I'm not talking about religion at the moment. Everything that we are taught, about science particularly, just could be wrong. And there may be some frightful flaw that nobody's thought about. Has that ever occurred to you? Something really fundamental. I mean, in either in mathematics or science itself, or anything you like. What would you say then? Any, any, any well, other? The molecule yeah, structure yeah. might yes, be wrong. The molecule structure might yes. be wrong. I mean, um, the, molecu the molecules that we know are based on carbon. Ah, now who's told you this? Our science master. And you just accept it? Naturally, because I can't think of anything else that it could be made up of. I see. Well, that's a jolly good reason. Some, so well, it could be some unheard of thing. Very fair. They think for themselves, but perhaps only within certain limits. We must accept some things, I know that, but there's a danger that we're going to turn into regimented sheep if we accept too much. Or, have we already done it? Now, look at this post box. Nowadays, we're told that if we want a letter delivered in a reasonable time, we've got to put fivepence on it, not fourpence. And everybody meekly does it, so the price stays at fivepence. Whereas if people protested and only put fourpence on, the price would bound to come down. Nobody but a sheep would post a letter under such conditions. Closed. It would be, of course, because the bank's only open when everyone's at work and can't get there. And it doesn't occur to them to stagger their hours at all. What one does, they all do, which makes them extremely awkward. Uh, yes, and there's another thing too, you know. What about this question of coinage? I've got in my hand here a two-shilling piece, a sixpence, and a threepenny bit, and I know exactly what they are and what they mean. But in a year or two's time, we're all going to go over to this extraordinary decimal coinage idea, and nobody will understand it. But because we are told to do it, we're going to do it. And then consider bus timetables. In very many cases, independent operators could run services very much more cheaply and very much more efficiently than the official ones, and yet they are not allowed to do so. And so we just go on waiting very meekly for our buses, and sometimes we wait for hours. You see what I mean by that? Driving on the wrong side of the road, most dangerous. And they're going to try and make us do it in a few years, simply and merely because the rest of Europe does, and I don't like to think what the results are going to be. And I very much fear that I'm one of these sheep already. I have become ultra-conventional. I believe that the Earth is a planet, uh, a globe nearly 8,000 miles across going around the Sun. I believe that the Moon is another globe going around the Earth, that the Sun is a star, and that the other stars are themselves suns. And I base this upon uh, what I hope is reasonable interpretation of the facts, as I've been told them, and the things that I've seen through this telescope. And, of course, in astronomy, there's a great deal we don't know. But we are learning more every year, in fact, every month, for example, we have now the idea of going out into space with projects such as Apollo. 20 seconds out, we get all out and clear, Frank Foreman. All looks great. As the astronauts went moonward, they could see the Earth. And to most people, this new view confirmed that the world is a globe, but not to everyone. And while in Apollo 8, the commander, Colonel Borman, mentioned the views of Mr. Samuel Shenton, president of the International Flat Earth Society, who lives in Dover and who believes the Earth is shaped like a gramophone record, with the North Pole in the middle and a wall of ice all round the edge. Uh, links very much with the statement which was given out by uh, General Borman, the astronaut. He spoke about the Earth in its early stages this, the Earth in its early stages was revealed from the waters and it was revealed as a, a four-square fabric. Like or, this, in fact? Absolutely like that. And this is water around it? Absolutely, yes, yes. The waters were dispelled from the Earth and the whole thing was covered by uh, a heaved-up structure, shami him in the Hebrew, a heaved-up structure actually in water. What about the astronauts then? If they didn't in fact go round the Earth, uh, what did they go round? Their track uh, goes across the Earth's surface, yes, so much so in that... Here. The North Pole in the middle and the South Pole all round. Yes. Uh, the astronauts are fired off from Cape Canaveral, uh, or Kennedy as it is yes. today. Uh, they went on a, an egg-shaped orbit 
over this like that. Keeping the same height all the time? Absolutely so. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Littleton said that the, uh, to put a thing into orbit, you carry it up to a height and then level off. What exactly is this line here? Oh, they, those uh, result uh, from the camera uh, photographing the, the horizon uh, and the, the photographs result in these humped effects which people are presented with that they think the Earth is round. In fact, there isn't any South Pole. No, no, no. The um, 60,000 miles was round the ice barrier and uh, so far man has not gone across the ice barrier to investigate any further. There's one theory I can think of which was completely wrong but which nevertheless led to some rather interesting research. And that was the idea that the Earth is the inside of a hollow sphere. So that Australia's above our heads somewhere, the sun's in the middle surrounded by a crystal sphere upon which the stars are etched, and the Earth extends below our feet infinitely in all directions and rises up like this, so to speak. Well, it's a fascinating idea. And in the early 1930s, it percolated through to Germany, and the City Council of Magdeburg offered to finance a rocket to be sent out vertically to see whether, in fact, it would crash land in Australia. They took this idea to the German rocket experimenters, people like Werner von Braun, and they did, in fact, finance and launch two rockets to test the theory. In fact, the first rocket rose to about 10 feet and then exploded. On the second occasion, the rocket launcher was horizontal instead of vertical, so the entire thing was inconclusive. Certainly, von Braun and his workers had no faith whatever in hollow globes. But all the same, these independent thinkers did finance some research which, at the time, was jolly useful. Flat Earths, Hollow Earths. In either case, the Earth would be the most important body in the universe. That was the ancient idea, and it isn't dead yet. It also survives in astrology. To the astrologer, the destinies of men are affected by the positions of the planets in the sky. And this implies, as the ancients did, that the Earth is all-important, and that everything else is there for our convenience. It's an attractive idea, and this may be while it still has a large following. I talked about it to Mrs Parker, who is secretary to the Faculty of Astrological Studies. Well, a little while ago, um, I consulted the daily papers and looked ah. at my horoscope for the, uh, for, for the week or so, and when you compared the two, they were entirely different. Oh, of course, this has absolutely nothing to do with the sort of astrology that I, I'm concerned with at all. That's just fun, pop astrology, if you like. <laughs> um, heaven forbid that one should be associated with that. Of course, one can't possibly... Um, divide the world into 12 neat little sections like that. I mean, this is ridiculous. One thing that uh, always interests me, uh, you say, and I don't dispute you, that astrology actually works. Why? Why should the positions of the planets have any effect upon human destinies at all? Well, of course, this is a $64,000 question. And I must be the first to admit, and I'm sure every logical, every sensible astrologer would say the same, that we do not know it could be because of the, so, uh, of the solar system being such a, a compact unit of space that we are interdependent on each other. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. Would you say that your, your life is really ruled by the stars? Oh, not at all, no. I'm, I look upon astrology as a perfectly practical subject. Um, rather like um, uh, a captain of a ship using a weather forecast, if one wants to use it, um, with regard to... People. And you think that astrology really can have a beneficial effect upon people? Oh, absolutely, because through astrology, one can learn much more about oneself. Uh, what do you think is the future of astrology? Oh, definitely with the psychiatrists and the psychologists. This is where our future lies. I'm afraid, as far as with the astronomers are concerned, we've parted and never the twain shall meet. One trouble about the independent thinker is that he finds it very difficult indeed to prove himself right. But equally certainly, it's very difficult to prove him wrong. And if you think about it, you know, you can't prove a negative. For example, I can't prove to you that the sun's going to rise in the east tomorrow morning. I think it is, because all the evidence I have indicates that way, but I can't absolutely prove it. And this is the way all the way through. And history, too, is studied with people who were, in some cases, right and in others, wrong. Consider the people who first maintained that the Earth goes round the sun instead of the other way round. People like Aristarchus in Greek times and Copernicus in the 16th century. They were regarded as quite definitely eccentric. And in the early part of the 17th century, there was a tremendous storm about it, and it even led to a trial in Rome in which Galileo, the great scientist, was accused of impiety. And then coming on to more modern times, what about Sir William Herschel, probably the greatest observational astronomer who's ever lived, and who only died in 1822, but who nevertheless believed that there were people living inside the sun. And then there was Simon Newcomb, a man who did tremendous work in astronomy, and who proved, to his own satisfaction, that the aeroplane would never fly. In fact, he said that the only practicable form of flying machine was something pulled by a large crop of little birds. 
Then we had Professor Lowell, a great American astronomer, whose uh, mathematical researches led to the discovery of the new planet Pluto. But he believed that there were canals on the planet Mars, and that Mars was the seat of a brilliantly intelligent race who had covered the entire world with a kind of irrigation system. History is studied with people like this. They can't prove they're right. Equally certainly, it's difficult to prove that they're wrong. What the independent thinker has to do is to start absolutely from scratch, look out into the universe, take what he sees there and then put his own independent opinion on it without bothering about anybody else.